Jakob, hello from Berlin. Can you hear us? Hello. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. I would say this, the stage is all yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Giacomo Tenaglia. I'm uh, a computer scientist working at, at CERN. And um, while my, my daily job is, is like a system administrator and in, in the team providing the scientific computing platforms, uh, for the for the CERN community and the config management tools, uh, I'm also working part time on the at the CERN Open Source Program Office, and um, so I will. Uh, so I'm happy to be virtually here with you today to to present you a little bit the what what is going on, what has gone on uh, behind the scenes. So a bit of the backstage of our initiative to start an open source program office at CERN, and. Um, and how and a little bit of a future outlook. I'll start with a uh, with a short presentation about about CERN. So we are a, an international particle physics laboratory located in Switzerland and France. So actually, the dotted line you can see here is the is the border between the Swiss side that contains the lake and the and the French side. Uh, and we are um, we've been founded in 1954. And uh, the mission, the core mission of the organization is, is to provide, uh, is to make like fundamental research to uncover what the universe is made of and how it works. So in practice, we study the very small to understand the very big. This is what they say. Uh, and we have uh, we have around 2.5 thousand staff and uh, and 12 thousand researchers from around the globe. So the idea is that we maintain and run a, a laboratory, and when you you do your research at your organizational research center, and then you come over to 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 actually uh, do the experiments live at our lab. So our flagship machine is a is a 27 kilometers particle accelerator called the Large Hadron Collider. It's located around 100 meters underground, and there we accelerate uh, particle charged particles to nearly the speed of light. And we steer their trajectory with uh, large magnets that you can see in this picture. So the blue one is the uh, th there's about 1,200 of them in in the tunnel, and this is a dipole magnet that serves to to curve the trajectory of the particles. Uh, there's a number of challenges with that, uh, mainly the fact that the particles go very fast, so you need a very high magnetic field to change to to bend their trajectory. In order to do this, you need superconducting magnets that need to be very cold, uh, less than two uh, degrees Kelvin. And so this is colder than outer space. And uh, and in the beam pipe, you need to have a vacuum. Otherwise, the particles collide with air particles. And this, uh, OK, so th there's a number of technical challenges. And the interesting thing is that the two particle beams that you see in the, in the picture, they cross over in four experimental areas in four points on the on the 27 kilometers uh, tunnel where um, physicists have built gigantic machines that are called detectors. And um, so I had to put, so I'm not a physicist, I'm a computer scientist, but I had to put the, the, the Einstein equation there because it's actually very, very interesting to what happens inside these detectors once we smash two beams of uh, particles at a very high speed. Um, so the, the Einstein equation says that mass is equivalent to energy because C is the speed of light, is a constant, but it's a very large constant. So typically we see, the, we see it in action from right to left. When we burn some mass, we generate some energy, but we never see it on the other, from happening from left to right because we live at, in a, in a world uh, at a low energy, let's say. So, so in the in a particle accelerator is is one of the the, the places uh, where you can actually see it happen from left to right. So when we smash two um, beams of uh, of particles at running at high speed, high energy, uh, basically you see new particles appearing for a brief period of time. So it's like 
uh, accelerating. It's like smashing together two apples and seeing one banana and one pear coming out, not just broken well, pieces of apples. Uh, this is not a very physical. I apologize to the physicists in the in the audience. Uh, so basically, what happens is that in those four interaction points, we build uh, uh, some international collaborations that are exper LHC experiments, build gigantic cameras that can measure basically what happens. So the energy, uh, the charge, and the trajectory of the new particles. So every piece of these, those machines is is able to measure uh, one specific thing. And this generates around 4 million, 40 million uh, uh, images of the state of the detector per second. Uh, in fact, most of the stuff is is, is boring, and um, and so it, it's not kept. There's uh, like some clever electronics that are able to filter out stuff that is not uh, interesting and um, and is not kept. So in practice, then it looks like this. Uh, in the in the, in the reconstruction, so basically the the inter you can see the interaction point uh, at, in the center, and then the the various parts of the detector that are switched on by the uh, by the um, by the particles traveling through them. The particles that bend their trajectory are charged; the other ones are not, etc. Because there there's like big magnets also inside the experiments. Um, so this, uh, as you can see, generate, uh, generates a lot of data. So we have, uh, we've been operating, uh, building and operating for the last 20 plus years, um, a worldwide uh, a distributed computing platform that is called the WLCG, the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid. And it is basically a network of um, data centers in hosted at research institutes, universities around the planet, and that are able to, uh, that are distributing the, the load of processing and storing uh, and analyzing the, the data produced by the, by the LHC experiments. And the physicists, they have a unique, uh, a, a simple uniform interface to submit jobs that are then executed in various parts of the of the grid, depending on many many factors, you can on the selected architecture, selected operating system, etc., data locality, and and so on. So there's around more than one thousand petabytes of of CERN data are basically stored also worldwide um, on disk and on tapes. We also still use tapes because they are cheap. Uh, one important part of the of the mandate of of CERN as an organization in the that is written in the convention um, is that the results of the of the research have to be published uh, and and made generally available so the so in order to understand this we need to think about how the the organization was funded uh, right after the second world war and when cold war was starting to kick in and uh, and the idea was to build a laboratory for science for peace so an essential ingredient was to be able to publish also all the results of the research to the to the whole planet and not keeping them secret uh, so th this has been uh, really an important guiding principle uh, throughout all the history of the of the organization and this has led to initiatives that are then that you can see a little bit in this timeline from, I mean, one of the most famous one was the invention of the web in 1989 to share documents uh, and um, between physicists and scientists. That obviously was a successful one. We also have been active in the, in the open access area since the uh, over the last like 10 uh, 20 years uh, in basically in lowering the in in getting rid of the paywalls uh, for accessing the results of CERN research uh, the on the open data side we have launched like an open data portal in in 2015 where the experiments can publish their their, their raw data for for people to to take a peek, uh, analyze, and and run some simulations at home and this kind of stuff, and also to reproduce. It's very important to 
to be able to reproduce and and reuse the the data so we have a dedicated uh, uh, framework that we developed and in 2022 we got approved uh, by the CERN management an open science a real open science policy that is covering all the aspects of of open science including open source hardware and software and uh, and for this we got the, we got the OSPO approved last year i wanted just to take also a um, a step back and look at open source specific uh, milestones and uh, we can see that the culture of sharing on the at CERN started in the in the 70s we had the first iteration of the CERN school of computing that is still running and the idea was that computers started to really take over the the, the scientific landscape and the and CERN thought we we needed to educate um scientists uh computer scientists and engineers to and physicists to the usage of of tools for high energy physics and in the in the, at the beginning of the 80s while the the world was starting to to adopt uh, free and open source software concepts um cern and other laboratories decided to 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 share two very important pieces of the tool chain for running analysis. And one was a tape that was called the HEP VM, High Energy Physics VM for, for VMS, that was helping, uh, that was containing all the environment to set up simulations and run them. And the other one was CERN Lib, which is the core library of, of routines used to actually run uh, the scientific software and, and and calculations so some of those routines interestingly enough are dating back to the to 1966 68 so this is really predating some of the most of the world maybe uh, open source uh, in more recent times after the web was released in 1989 in the public domain and after Tim Berners-Lee left to, to MIT to go fund the W3C, um, the team at CERN decided that public domain was not good enough and re-licensed the, the, the web components as open source with a dedicated CERN license. This is something you would not do today, but it was a, it was a good, deemed a good choice at the time in order to prevent uh, companies from just taking the the, the the software and make it proprietary. Then this was later re-licensed with the MIT license. And um, and in the in the last then then after that, our colleagues uh, making uh, custom hardware for for certain accelerators. There's a lot of custom, of course, stuff that we that we have to design. Uh, decided uh, started to adopt also concepts uh, similar to those of open source. So the four freedoms of software, but just adding the freedom to manufacture the hardware to share their designs. And in 2011, we uh, they wrote the Javier and his team wrote the CERN Open Hardware license that is now at this second version has been published a couple of years ago. And, uh, and shortly after that, we got the blessing from the management in the form of a task force. So when we get an official task force, it means we you basically made it. And, um, and that wrote recommendations to, to release certain software under OSI approved licenses. So this was the first uh, official recommendation that we, that we had. And, and interestingly enough, the team that wrote the the, the, the recommendation was composed of uh, also Javier from the Open Hardware and Francois Flukiger, who was uh, responsible for licensing the web in 1994. So some of the experts who've been doing open source for years. Uh, then, of course, in the last 10 years, things escalated quickly. And uh, we ran a little survey last year about the service on the on the IT department. The service is run by the IT department, and we um, and service managers were declaring that basically seventy percent. So we run we are a kind of a classic IT department running everything from network to um, to 
our own data center, orchestration stuff, infrastructure as a service with OpenStack, platforms with OpenShift. We run many software as a service, so we run more, more than 100 different services and 70% of, of those run rely on a major uh, free and open source software component. So uh, th this is excluding like basic common um, components such as the Linux kernel, et, et cetera. So, and, and of those around two thirds have uh, uh, significant CERN contributions. So we could show to the, so it was clear, it's clear that over the last 10 years, the the adoption of of open source as a as a consumer but also as a contributor has grown uh, tremendously and uh, the, there's been also initiatives to move from homegrown config management and orchestration tools to more standard components we joined also the openstack and now the open infrastructure board um of course now using also kubernetes uh, recently switching to alma linux and uh, and there's a lot of uh, there's been a lot of active engagement with uh, with the user development communities. Another interesting development and side effect of this massive adoption of of open source has been uh, what we call the Malt project that started in 2019 to re uh, to rationalize the provisioning of software licenses and evaluate replacement of proprietary components with free and open source software ones. We succeeded in some of the initiatives. We failed in some other initiatives. Uh, there were many, many lessons learned on accounting, eligibility, standardization, but especially in, in engagement with the, with the user community at CERN and with the upstream uh, communities uh, in order to better understand our needs and how we could convey them in the in the upstream products and at the same time on the on the scientific on the more uh, scientific side uh, there's been also a shift towards um, reuse of CERN made stuff software and hardware for uh, beyond high energy physics we have some of the some examples are our conference management software that is now being used uh, elsewhere in, in other institutes and, uh, and organizations. We have obviously storage, but also the data analysis and the scientific computing route, which is the successor of CERN Leap that I mentioned earlier, and uh, is, is being used also in financial institutes and uh, around, the, around the globe. And also on hardware, we, we actually discovered by chance that White Rabbit, which is a fine, uh, a fine uh, timing, fine tune uh, timing protocol and implementation uh, was used by, uh, I think, a German uh, science, uh, a German financial institute by by chance. So we set up also a collaboration to collaborate with them, and uh, and there's been in general a lot of effort and uh, to to and and investment in in making CERN products, let's say, go beyond high energy physics and be reusable elsewhere. And in general, one common thing uh, throughout the last, yes, 10, 20 years has been, there has to be like a more systemic approach to how we do open source. And um, there's been many questions coming up that were slightly similar how to from the basic ones how to license code people were choosing different licenses uh, open sourcing in different ways uh, we needed we, we were we started to be asked from external entities how to how we were positioned as an organization in some with regard of some questions on open source and and uh, we had some problems of um, uh, with with the licensing components, uh, how to accept contributions to certain open source projects, how to actually contribute to an open source project that requires signature of a contributor license agreement that nobody, this we spent like a couple of months trying to understand who was actually entitled to sign this and uh, it's still unclear, uh, but no, it's not still unclear. Uh, we finally cleared it out, but uh, it's 
it took some it took some time to to understand and gather experience that that is very much distributed across the organization so we started discussing with the, with a few with a few experts and partic- practitioners in in open source a couple of years ago uh, the um, the need for creating something more formal uh, and at the same time something more recognizable by the by the CERN community um, and um, and we started putting together a proposal for an open source program office and these things take a lot of time in a in a consensus driven organization like CERN so you really need to convince a lot of people and make your point make your case and uh, and rework various uh, proposals etc so we started uh, i actually started some of the presentations in december and it was basically not very encouraging the the feedback i got it was particularly complicated to work with our um with our knowledge and technology transfer colleagues with some of the high management that we are not really seeing the point in having to set up something for something that we can get for free. And, um, but fortunately we, the, the people at the organization are amazing and they're super motivated and we managed to have a, to have an official task force launched in October, 2022 with the, with the goal of, uh, with a specific task to write the mandate for an open source program office. It took around six months and many, many discussions and meetings. We got our, we got a couple of uh, amazing colleagues from the tech transfer office that helped a lot in, uh, because basically it's important to understand that also in, in, in public organizations like CERN or like universities, the tech transfer office is responsible for managing the IP portfolio and it's tricky to to go there and say listen we want to just publish everything for free so it's uh it's it's challenge and uh and i think it's it's great to have people who are able to understand also open source business models and uh and to try to to have them on board and to and to involve them and that they were actually very very instrumental in in getting the mandate approved in in may 2023 uh, and uh, we had the official meeting in September. Then we had a great logo designed. You can see here some sketches. And, um, and then we had the launch event in in November last year. So the so this is the final logo that we chose. Um, and um, the mandate is as most of OSPOs is divided in two parts, one internal and one external. So internally, we are mandated to uh, basically consult, advise, and train, trying to consolidate all the knowledge that is uh, scattered across the organization in a single place and we to have a single voice, uh, and in particular on open sourcing certain software and hardware. We are also mandated um, to uh, track the dependency of the of the of CERN and on critical on on free and open source software components in particular for critical IT services critical to the operation of the of the organization and um, this at the moment we are at at this point we are not at the point of how to do if we identify that the health of a of a critical dependency is not good so this is for for a later stage and also to advise the CERN management in case there's um, open source questions or, or issues. Uh, in general, we try to avoid uh, one key part of getting the mandate approved was to avoid other putting advocating advocating for open source in the mandate. So of course we are all uh, like open source enthusiasts, so it kind of comes naturally. But the, the official mandate is excluding is not specifically talking about advocating for open source. And then in the, the external mandate is more about showcasing the contributions to open source uh, made by the organization and facilitate partnership with external entities and promote the lab uh, as an open source um, good citizen in general. 
So in practice, we are um, we are a group of twelve people who, in real life, do uh, other things that are typically linked with open source. We have a person who was the project leader of the root uh, software. We have Javier, who is uh, the open hardware guru. We have uh, the head of the open science uh, office. We have many people doing. Uh, we have, of course, both kinds of physicists, the theoretical and the applied experimental physicists, because they both use and produce a lot of open source. We have engineers, hardware engineers and software engineers. And we have our knowledge transfer experts. We have uh, been lucky enough to have been joined by a, by a knowledge transfer uh, legal advisor. And already uh, this was last month. I already learned a lot about how to write things, what to write, what not to write in, in official documents. So it's, it's actually very interesting. And every one of us has around um, 10 to 20 percent of our time allocated for this. We have a few interns as well who are 100 percent, fortunately, who can help us. And they're actually a great driving force as well. And, uh, but in general, we operate as a, as a, as a part of our job. Uh, so it's not, there's no one uh, fully 100% uh, on, on this. And uh, at the moment, we are um, we're working on writing a, a technical website that, of course, brings up issues of defining uh, recommendations and policies and, uh, and mechanisms, so how to implement the the policies and um, we are doing this as as we serve internal requests so now of course people have noticed that we have um, an office and we we're happy about this and at the same time we get uh, like kind of um, yes bombarded by by requests all the time so we are trying to to answer them and at the same time build a knowledge base and our technical website so this is Good, but it takes time because we also work as a consensus-driven board, and it's tricky to sometimes to to discuss and agree. But we eventually are close to publishing our internal website. Uh, so, in general, the for this year we plan to focus on on three major um, axes. One is to publish our um, software catalog. So there's around, we have an internal GitLab uh, instance with uh, uh, tens of thousands of projects. And we have uh, a few hundred, if, if you search on GitHub, there's a few hundred organizations that are linked in a way or another to CERN. There's an official CERN organization with, the tens, with a few tens of projects, but then there's many other organizations. And, um, so we would like to to provide another a, a, a catalog where we showcase basically where projects can submit can opt in to be part of and uh, and can be and can be seen uh, all in one place and searched all in one place so this is being developed and will be published later this year um, basically together with the with the new version of the open hardware catalog that has been worked on and will be published uh, as well this summer. Yes. Um, then we, of course, uh, with the, with the mandate, we have been asked to produce a, a yearly report, and uh, so for this we need something to measure, and which is, which is actually great because we we in general like to measure things, but also we would like to start providing projects some uh, meaningful uh, metrics and ways of, of measuring their project and observing how they are doing in terms of both quality of their, of their contributions to external, to, to other projects or in general, how they are doing in the, in the community of their, if they are able to build a community, if there's contributions to their project that they are maybe not noticing, maybe there is a pattern that we can notice of other organizations contributing to a, a set of projects. For this, we've been, uh, we are going to look at the, at the chaos metrics over the last, over the next few months and, and hopefully integrate all this and, and deploy some tooling for, for measuring. We, so we can, um, provided to to the CERN community, and uh, and another request that we have outstanding is to 
to set up a training program for for our for our developers probably it will be like a short like one day training on how to how to publish code how to do things properly how to accept contributions so documentation is piling up we are we are really starting to write a lot of um, of documentation so it will be probably th there is material to to write a, to write a little internal course to to help people one thing that is very peculiar is that in general development teams change a lot so people come and go all the time it's very rare that people stay for more than a, than a couple of years uh, some people stay just for summer as summer students and they do like significant contributions to some projects hardware or software some people stay for around a year and um, some people come and go every few weeks or months and um, and so so it's it's very important that practices are kind of consistent across the board and this also can help us in uh, in identifying what's going on and showcasing to the society but also to certain management that this actually matters and that, that they did a good thing deciding to create to 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 approve the the creation of of certain open source program office so um so also the training of 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 people it's instrumental for for this um so i think this is uh more or less everything i wanted to say for for today to present you about the CERN open source program office and uh, i really wanted to thank I, i've been in contact with some people that i know are maybe in the audience and i wanted to thank them for their help and um, and i wanted to also thank my colleagues and my colleague zunia who couldn't be here today for the opportunity to present and for their help in in building this presentation All right. Thank you, Jagal. Raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, since there are no other questions, a quick one. I was wondering how many people are involved in maintaining your infrastructure, your IT, all of the systems you mentioned in the beginning. Uh, so the, the systems I mentioned in the beginning are the just the grid uh, systems. And on my team, we are about 10. But we do many other things. We do um, we do the of course the the grid computing is is I think we have around fifteen thousand boxes physical machines, and uh, but also we provide the config management tools for the whole organization. So we have some central puppet infrastructure, and uh, and secrets management, and yeah, many other many other glues to. To, to make everything work. So we are, yes, we are around 10. Uh, I, I would say we're around nine full-time equivalent. Uh, the, the IT department that is developing storage systems, conference management systems, uh, running uh, telef IP telephony systems, network, we are around 250. Yes, Th this is mostly the IT infrastructure. Then of course there's IT everywhere. I mean, everywhere, everyone is developing uh, software and and doing infra stuff. But yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, how is the general mindset at CERN? Is it very open to open source, or is it um, we don't really care about it, or are they even more uh, into towards closing down stuff and uh, in a sense of a competition with other research institutes? Can you say something about that? Yeah, so I, I think researchers in general are mostly, let's just put this out and uh, and publish it. So then uh, open source sometimes is, is a bit uh, of an afterthought. Um, nowadays things are changing because it's also great to to show to the world that you're that you're doing open source right. So on your GitHub. And if you can show that you contribute to some certain projects, is even is great. So people really are pushing to to have it done properly. So this on the let's say on the grassroots side, on the on the management side, there is more and more like um, yes, uh, openness to be open. 
And of course, because it's also part of the mandate, there's been some resistance on, in particular for the for for the hardware side because because it's tricky to to convince that we have a great idea that could be reused elsewhere and uh, it's a piece of hardware that could we could really maybe like make a partnership and sell the IP and in fact we actually want to open source it so it's it, it's tricky but finding uh, but our colleagues doing hardware are, are great at that are at finding some business models for this, like launching foundations, that there's, there will be a launch of the White Rabbit Foundation in a few weeks at CERN. That is a partnership with other, with other institutes, public and private. Uh, and in general, uh, in, the, in the IT department, this is reality I know most. There is a lot of push for, um, for open source and, and doing it right and contributing back to upstream. So there's some of our group leaders that have been on the... Uh, open infrastructure board of directors. Uh, we had the colleague who was on the CEF board of directors, and uh, so yes, it's recognized as vital for the for the survival of the organization. Do you have trouble maintaining sort of momentum on the things that you want to do? Uh, you mentioned that the majority of your OSPO are people who work in it part time. So I'm interested in like how you get things done, because that's a really difficult situation to be in. Yes, it is. Uh, fortunately enough, we are on uh, very different uh, domains. So typically conferences and big events happen at different times, kind of. So um, there's, uh, but, and sometimes we, we kind of organize like one day hackathons to where we put everyone together and then you cannot escape. And and we get together and we get things moving. Like every couple of months, we had uh, we had one last month. It was very productive, and we yeah. So th th this was actually a great a great initiative that came from one of our interns who was proposing this, and uh, and this helps. And yeah, because 10, 20 percent of the time is not that much. It's easy to to either spend it answering emails or spend or just getting to Friday 7 p.m. and there's no 10, 20 percent that went in the OSPO work. Eh? So, but also the fact that many people are actually doing open source in their daily job, it's it's kind of a driver uh, to, to improve things and to, and to work on things. For example, me, I'm working with a colleague who, and we need to contribute to some Puppet modules upstream, and there was a question about whether I should use my private email address, my private GitHub profile, how to handle email addresses, and this was a need that I had in my daily, in my daily work from from a colleague. So we could just make it into a recommendation from the from the OSPO. All right. A final question from the online audience. Uh, you mentioned that when you OSPO became visible, you got lots of requests coming in. What sort of things were you asked in the beginning? So in the beginning, we've been asked uh, how to publish our code in general. And uh, th this is the most frequent uh, question, which is also yes, normal. And uh, because people realize that this could have an impact and maybe they were not thinking about it. And then you get, yes, requests to publish like projects that can vary in, um, in let's say, readiness states. So some projects are maybe more ready and some other projects ship maybe other libraries or binary lab view files that you maybe want to not to ship. So they have to refactor and then we have to iterate and, and ask many questions. So after some of the requests, people were basically expecting, we realized that people were expecting kind of, uh, uh, you just choose this license and you put it on, on GitHub on this organization kind of answer. But in fact, we structured the answer asking actually more questions about how the project is done, how the project is, uh, is uh, what are the dependencies of the project, where it is deployed and, and other things that people were not really expecting. So some people came back and they said, well, I was expecting a lighter project process. But in fact, uh, asking all those questions helped in, uh, in understanding the, the nature of some projects. And then sometimes the recommendation was uh, maybe it's not a good idea to to open source at this point, you should do this, this, this before, and and then maybe the team decided not to open source in that case. So, 
All right. Thank you, Giacomo, for your great talk. Um, we're going to go now take a short coffee break. Thank you. So thank you, Giacomo. <laughs>